Welcome to Cherry Girlfriends Church. Today is Sunday, June 19th, 2022. So welcome to Cherry Grove. Um, it's always difficult to interrupt this, this time where we get to love and share and commiserate with each other. And um, we're, we're supposed to love God and love our neighbor. So now's the time where we turn from loving our neighbor to loving and worshiping, praising our God. So uh, let's get to that, shall we? We're going to start today with a reading from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. Uh, pardon me, 65, 1 through 9. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here I am, here I am. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in the ways in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations, a people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs and whose pots hold broth of impure meat, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too sacred for you. Such people are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that keeps burning all day. See, it stands written before me. I will not keep silent, but it will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps, both your sins and the sins of your ancestors, says the Lord, because they burned sacrifices on the mountains and defiled me on the hills. I will measure into their laps the full payment for their former deeds. This is what the Lord says. As with juice is still found in a cluster of grapes, and people say, don't destroy it, there's still a blessing in it. So will I do in behalf of my servants. I will not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah those who will possess my mountains. My chosen people will inherit them, and there will, be serv and there will my servants live. Lord, we praise you. We praise you for calling us. We've gone our own way for so long, almost from the beginning, that our well-practiced habits is to not look for you. We're no longer capable of searching for you on our own. How rightly you call us obstinate, and how thankful we are that you are fully honest with us. Thank you for continuing to speak to us, to try and get us to notice and pay attention that our wandering is futile. We praise your patience with us, knowing that it's your grace and not your justice that drives that patience. We don't deserve what you do for us. We certainly don't earn it. In fact, we earn your wrath continually. We thank you for making us in your image. And we thank you for maintaining us in that image, for making sure that no matter how much we want to eliminate it, some of that image is retained so that we can be identified as yours, both by you and by each other. And lastly, we praise you because of who you are, our creator and sustainer, our judge, our redeemer, and our friend. Amen. So let us begin by worshiping through song with the uh, with this, uh, hymn, Tis So Sweet. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know, thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Jesus, Jesus, how I 
trust him more Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. Thank you, Rob. I, now I have volume. Um, so this morning I'm going to do a reading from uh, 1 Kings 19, uh, and then we'll have a prayer of confession. And I, I'm going to be doing our prayer of confession out of uh, Every Moment Holy by Douglas McKelvey, partly because I wrote one, and then I realized his is just better. So anyway, <clears throat> so read with me 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 18, the story of Elijah. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain by the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, 
and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel-Mehelah, to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Word of the Lord. Again, this is a liturgy from Douglas Cain McKelvey for those who have not done great things for God. How many times have I been told, O Christ, by well-meaning people, that it is my destiny and my charge to go into the world and do great things for you? How many times, in response, have I prayed earnestly, asking that you would bring such thing to pass, that you might make me mightily for the work of your kingdom? How many times have I then waited expectantly and waited and waited for those great things, whatever they might be, to be made obvious? How many times have I felt them then gradually settling weight of disillusionment, of disappointment and confusion when no great thing materialized, when no life-changing opportunity suddenly arrived at my doorstep, and when no such moment of call or clarity was ever manifest at all? In the confused afterglow of those receding anticipations, I am always faced again with the unglamorous reality of my own life, of my ongoing failure simply to love well the people around me, and of my own ever-present struggle even to desire and to pursue a path of righteousness and obedience in my own small daily choices and habits. I am faced again with the same litany of tired old temptations, towing their attendant shames, And in such times I am left, O Lord, wondering if I have somehow missed your call completely, and whether I might just as well abandon this pilgrim path entirely, for I fear that you must see me as I see myself, unfit for any service to you, or to your people, or to this world. So tell me, my God, where is the disconnect between the life rife with breathtaking demonstrations of your power that I am told should be hallmarks of my walk with you? Where is the disconnect between those fantastic notions and the reality of my actual life, which is filled with petty frustrations, mundane responsibilities, and constant reminders of my own failure to wear well the name of Christ? What is wrong that I should even desire to do great things with you, for you, Jesus? Am I amiss to plead that I might mightily be used in your works? Do I need more faith, more righteousness, more of your spirit? Or have you simply judged me unworthy of your service? Where, O Lord, do I go from here? We will conclude the service with the rest of that prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the great healer uh, whose uh, will extends even to the inner workings of our bodies and all of the things that happen to us that may be confusing or difficult for us are neither confusing nor difficult for you. Uh, I pray for Randy as he uh, has to sit in recovery um, and get over this disease, uh, that you would both uh, make that healing process rapid um, and also uh, give give his heart an awareness of the things that you would have him learn through this process and and give him the opportunity to rest, to really rest, um, and uh, not not just be frustrated, uh, but to see the things that you're doing. Um, and I pray for um, Elizabeth as she uh, uh, struggles with, with balance and uh, issues related to that, uh, related to her ears and uh, all of the things that have gone on with her health in the last few years. Uh, I just pray that you would give her peace of mind um, and give her body stability. And I pray also for Doug as he continues to care for her in all the ways that uh, he wants to, uh, that you would give him uh, peace in his heart knowing that you have put him there for that purpose at this time, and that what he is doing is enough. Uh, We thank you for the opportunity to bring these things before you, and we pray your mercies upon us as we continue to learn from your word, um, as we praise you in the ways we know how, and as you teach us ever more to appreciate the beauty that you are. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So I'm going to do a a reading from, this is Psalms 42 and 43, which 
if you don't know, are actually one psalm. Somebody screwed up somewhere. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys to read the, the leading part, and I'll respond with the italicized lines. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of the Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you will dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. It's the word of the Lord. Did that feel weird? <laughs> I don't know if you guys could hear it, but what I was hoping would happen happened, which is you all started on kind of different planes, but by that last stanza, you were all reading together. And that's a beautiful thing about Scripture is when you read it aloud like that together, you start in dissonance and you end in harmony. Um, and that really is the story that our God is telling about us. Uh, we begin in dissonance, but we end in harmony. Uh, speaking of harmony, we're going to sing. So we've got a couple of songs here. Uh, one is Pass Me Now, O Gentle Savior. Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Not Pass Me Now. Please don't. Um, pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, and Be Still My Soul. Uh, so please sing with me. <laughs> Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Wall on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou art called. 
trusting only in thy merit would I seek thy face heal my wounded broken spirit save me by thy grace save the 
start this sermon three times. <clears throat> um, first, I'm going to start with Happy Father's Day, Dad. He's not in the room, but I know he watches the video, so I'm going to get that in there. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm not going to make this service all about Father's Day, um, but I do want to take a minute and honor my father uh, for the one thing he gave me that is most precious. Uh, I, I know he made many mistakes, and I'm sure he, he agrees, uh, but he did one thing that every human father is truly called to do, which is introduce his children to the true and better father, to whom we all really belong and can really tell us who we are. And God called me to his family through my family. And that is one of the greatest gifts I've ever received. Uh, so happy Father's Day to those in the room. And happy Father's Day, Dad, when you watch the video. Uh, I'm going to read the scripture from Acts 12 and start the sermon a second time. <clears throat> so we're picking up from the execution of James that we talked about last week in Acts 12, 1 through 5, and this is immediately following. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards, and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of the street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to his senses himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Today is Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Have you ever celebrated Juneteenth before? Some of you have. I haven't. Like, this is not, not a thing that was part of my experience growing up. It wasn't a celebration that I ever felt normal about taking part in as a, you know, white, middle, approaching middle-aged pacifist, um, ce celebrating a, uh, a, a remembrance of slaves being legally freed by a military order by a conquering general uh, in Texas feels a little strange. Uh, it, it seems more like a moment for penitent reflection, to be honest with you. But the more I learn about the origins of the Juneteenth celebration, the more I, I feel like we, we actually should celebrate. Um, and here's why. It, the, the, the biggest reason is that Juneteenth began in a church. That it began because the first thing that freed slaves did uh, on Juneteenth in Galveston, Texas, was they went to church. They went to church. And that reminds me that the notion of personal freedom and the inherent dignity of every person, regardless of race or color or creed or whatever system of division you want to make, uh, that inherent dignity is as a reflection of the image of God is thoroughly Christian and ultimately can't come from anywhere else. So that's one reason. And, and second is because Juneteenth, the celebration, didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, the enslaved people in the American South had spent hundreds of years singing songs about deliverance, justice, and freedom while they toiled. They didn't know when, 
They didn't know how, but they knew that the God they worshipped could and would not allow the gross perversion of life in which they suffered to persist forever. They had hope. And so when the moment of emancipation came, their first act was not revenge. Their first act was not defiance. Their first act was worship and celebration. For while defiance in the face of injustice may be necessary, hope is far more so. Start number three. I love this picture of Peter being rescued from prison because I think it captures the goofiness of the moment. I don't know if you can see it up there, but this, the, the look on Peter's face is hilarious. He just looks confused. It's like, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, last week, we talked about four human responses to suffering. And after the service, I had a couple of conversations that stuck with me. Uh, first, someone noticed that these aren't just responses to suffering. Uh, They actually are how we respond to everything. Uh, They can be inverted to any event in life. The moralist who receives good news will say, well, I certainly deserve that because of my hard work and righteous life. And the the transformer will be equally concerned with detaching from the pleasant as from the painful. And the, the fatalist will find in rich rewards nothing but the same responses to suffering. Bear your place with stoicism. And the dualist will attribute good things to a good God and bad things to a bad one. And perhaps saddest of all, the secularist finds that the pleasure he runs into is just as empty in the end as the fleeing pain. Uh, Both are meaningless, a chasing after the wind, for it turns out that there is actually nothing new under the sun. Second conversation, someone pointed out that there is an element of truth in each of these. They all have a point. The the, the moralist has a point about there being natural consequences for our actions. The transformer has a point that being overly attached and having too many expectations will lead to suffering. And the fatalist has a point about the sovereignty of God and the importance of recognizing the variance of life. Sometimes bad things happen to you and it's not your fault. And the dualist has a point about the activity of our adversary and that there is a reality to evil. And that is one of the really hard things about being human. We are actually pretty smart creatures. I know, it's hard to believe that when you watch television, but it's true. We can come up with pretty decent frameworks for understanding the world we inhabit, but they're only just decent frameworks, not perfect. And they provide limited resources for dealing with life. But we need more than limited resources. Uh, We need infinite resources for meeting infinite problems, and particularly the one infinite problem, death, which brings us to Peter, who is facing death. Just because we happen to know the end of the story doesn't mean Peter does. And remember, as we talked about last week, James has just been executed summarily. And now Peter has been imprisoned, and Herod's plan is to bring Peter to trial Uh, right at the time of the Passover. Familiar story? Someone imprisoned? Show trial? Passover? Execution? This has happened before. I don't think Peter would be under any illusion that there was any outcome of this other than him being executed. And what is he doing? He's getting a real good night's sleep. Peter is imprisoned awaiting a show trial on the anniversary of the Garden of Gethsemane. And do you have any doubt he knew what was about to happen? No, he knew. He'd seen it before. They did it to Jesus and they would do it to him. And he's sleeping really well. He's sleeping so well that when an angel shows up to get him out of prison, he has to shove him to wake him up. Do you notice that in the text? Luke goes out of his way to tell us that The angel showed up. It was really bright. There was light. Peter's still out. The the, the angel has to, like, poke him. Be like, dude, dude, get up. And then he has to tell him, hey, put your clothes on. Get up. Follow me. 
Peter's waking up slow. He's been in a nice deep sleep. Is this the character of Peter? Is this the character of Peter that we know from the Gospels? The the guy who who got enraged and cut off a guy's ear with a sword? Uh, The guy who insisted that he was able to endure anything, go anywhere, and do anything for his Lord Jesus, and then in short order denied that he knew him at all? You know, you wouldn't necessarily describe the Peter we learn about in the Gospels as a calm, peaceful individual. Of course, there's one night he had slept before, the night Jesus asked him to stay awake and pray with him. That night, it appeared he couldn't stay awake. But I really don't think that's what's going on here. This doesn't strike me as a person who can't stay awake who's trying. Now, I think Peter was just zonked out because he was pretty chill about the whole thing. I don't get the impression that Peter couldn't stay awake in his chains. When the angel wakes him up, he just gets up and follows him out. And when he gets to the gate and the angel takes off, he doesn't even seem all that surprised. He just says, oh, I see what's happening. Guess I better get on with it. Now, what made Peter like this? Because this is a different Peter than the one we saw in the Gospels. It's even a different Peter than we saw at Pentecost. That Peter was willing to confront He was willing to get up in front of a crowd of people who had executed Jesus and tell the truth. But we've just read about James that James got no opportunity for a speech. He was just killed with a sword. And yet this Peter, Peter here, is just chill about the whole thing. He doesn't make a big deal out of being gotten out of prison. He thinks it's all a vision, figuring that maybe the Lord's just teaching him a lesson. There's no defiance in this moment. What made Peter the way he was here and now? Well, I think it was hope. Hope made this Peter. Peter didn't just happen. He was regenerated, grown, and shaped. The loosing of his chains was not in prison. It was in the words of Jesus when he said, "'Feed my sheep.'" You remember that story. Peter had betrayed Jesus in, in, in a way just as much as Judas by denying that he even knew who he was scant hours after promising that he was ready to follow Jesus into prison and death. After Jesus rises from the dead, Peter has gone back to fishing where he was before Jesus found him. He's going backwards. And then Jesus shows up and Peter runs towards him. And he has shown something beautiful beyond his betrayal, something astonishing. He's given hope when Jesus invites him to feed his sheep. And hope is what makes Peter able to sleep between two sets of guards bound with a chain. And hope makes Peter able to respond to his freedom with recognition of who saved him. You know, the the, the scene that's been set up here is really pretty comical. Uh, if you go back a couple of verses and you, we didn't talk about this last week, but the, the guards that Herod set up, he's got 16 guards watching Peter. He's got him bound with chains behind an iron gate. Like, this, this will sound a little bit like overkill. Like maybe this is a little over the top. That, that Herod is so worried and anxious about, Herod, about Peter getting away that he has to put an entire squad of soldiers to guard him and chain him behind a gate, and Peter is so chill about the whole thing, he just sleeps all night? I think there's a contrast being set up about who is confident. Who has hope? Peter has hope, and Herod doesn't. We'll see that later in the story in a couple weeks as we get through the chapter, that uh, Herod's hope is based on something very different than Peter's hope. hope. There is an astonishingly deep illustration of this in the work of J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, I know, you're shocked. I'm going to use a Tolkien quote. And you know, I I have a pretty good knowledge of Tolkien's work, but every once in a while something pops up that surprises me, and that actually happened this week. This this one was new to me. 
Uh, see, Tolkien is what I've started calling a shadow theologian. He, he, he writes fiction, a glorious, lovely, wonderful fiction, that it turns out is shot through with the gospel in all kinds of little unnoticeable ways. Uh, for instance, uh, do you ever notice that the Fellowship of the Ring, they, they leave Rivendell on Christmas, and Aragorn is crowned on Easter. The mission begins at Christmas, the mission ends at Easter. You wouldn't notice until you do, and you think, wow, where'd that come from? And Tol Tolkien is full of stuff like that. And here, here's another one. So in, in this scene, Sam and Frodo have come to Mordor. They're, they're nearing the end of their quest, but they're overwhelmed with exhaustion and depression of their spirit. Uh, in, in this scene, they're in sight of their goal, but filled with despair that they will never get there. And, and Sam has the opportunity to sleep, but he can't. Uh, he's just defied the monster Shelob and the orcs in the Tower of Kirith Ungol, and he's rescued Frodo. There's this wonderful scene where he's fighting off orcs, and they think he's a giant elf warrior, and he's a hobbit. It's, it's a cool scene. Uh, and he escapes, but his defiance isn't enough. He's still overwhelmed. And, and he's, he's lying on the ground, and he can't sleep even though he's exhausted. And he looks up, and the scene picks up. There, peeping among the cloud rack, above the dark tor high up in the mountains, Sam saw a bright star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart. As he looked up out of the forsaken land, and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing. That there was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. His song in the tower had been defiance rather than hope, for then he was thinking of himself. Now for a moment, his own fate, and even his master's, ceased to trouble him. He crawled back into the brambles and laid himself by Frodo's side, and putting away all fear, cast himself into a deep, untroubled sleep. The shadow is a small and passing thing because there is something forever beyond its reach. Defiance is rooted in your ability to endure, to attain a moral standard, to transform yourself or to pick the right side. Hope, hope as Tolkien understood and stood it, and he, he got this from Christianity, has to be something indestructible, untouchable, and eternal. And what is it? Well, here it's a star, but not really. Because if you delve into the backstory, you find that that star isn't a star. It's a person. A person named Arendil. A person with two natures. A person who braves an epic journey to plead the case of his exiled and desperate people before a divine throne. And who was raised to the skies to shine forever as a sign of hope to the exiled and the desperate. A person beyond death and beyond darkness, who yet at the same time is one of us. Tolkien's a shadow theologian. This is the Christian hope. It's not defiance. It's hope in something that is beyond the small and passing shadow, not within it. We are not disciples of Dylan Thomas. You know the Dylan Thomas uh, a, a poem, Let Us Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night? Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end know dark is night, because their words have forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright. Their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late, they grieved on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night, but rage, rage against the dying of the light. As beautiful as that poem is, we are not disciples of Dylan Thomas. We do not rage against the dying of the light. We look to the light beyond, an indestructible hope 
that is beyond the small and passing shadow. Beautiful people don't just happen. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said that beautiful people don't just happen. That's where the title of this book comes from. You may not recognize her name, but you're likely familiar with the five stages of grief, which she articulated. Uh, you might be also familiar with something called hospice and palliative medicine and end-of-life care, all of which she championed. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross absorbed, she, she observed more dying people than probably anyone who's ever lived. Uh, she spent her entire career watching people at the end of their lives, uh, from children to old age. And her conclusion was that the people who suffered well, who ended well, who died well, didn't just happen. That wasn't random. That they were the product of particular experiences and a particular view on those experiences. Uh, and, and just this last week, this came out on Tuesday, uh, Scott Sauls put out this book, and the title's taken from Kubler-Wass's quote, but it takes its thesis from Scripture. Sauls believes that beautiful people, uh, what he describes as beautiful people, people who live, suffering, rejo suffer, rejoice, and die well, don't just happen. They are the product of hope. They see what Samwise Gamgee sees, beauty that is beyond the passing shadow. They look beyond it and see a person who pled their case before a divine throne and rose to stand forever as a sign of hope. They see what the freed slaves in Galveston saw when they sang, Stony the road we trod, bitter at the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered, out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. They knew. They knew the star of hope as Jesus Christ, shining forever as our only hope as we live under a small and passing shadow. And so we know him. Christian, your hope is not just defiance or endurance. It is a crown. It is a glory. It is deeply tempting to believe that our hope is rooted in our ability to defy what stands in front of us. If you want to root, find the root of the problems in our politics right now, I guarantee you will find it when you find people who believe that their hope is rooted in defiance. Your hope is not defiance or endurance. It is a crown. It is glory. It is the resurrection of all things. It is the glorious answer to Sam. Samwise Gamgee asks a question at the end of Lord of the Rings uh, when he realizes that he has, the, the quest has been achieved and that his friend is alive, and he asks, is everything sad going to come untrue? Yes. Yes. Yes, dear friends, everything sad is going to come untrue. That is the Christian hope. It is the star that shines beyond the passing shadow. The only thing in which we can root ourselves such that though we sit in a cell chained, guarded by 16 soldiers, sure to be executed the next day, we sleep like babies. Because we know the star of hope shining forever as our only hope as we live under this small and passing shadow. And so we can sing. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. I'm going to have a song and a period of open worship, and we'll close with the benediction. And can it be that I should gain any interest in the
O child of God, listen well and be comforted. He has never judged you unfit for any service he has called you to. For it is in Christ's righteousness he has clothed you. And his measure of greatness has never been your own. If you would pray to do great things for your God, then you must pray such prayers without regard for how they should be answered. Pray them knowing that in his true and holy reckoning, such greatness will most often be expressed in a long practice of humble and sacrificial servanthood. And not in any pursuing promising a rise to power, position, or prestige. His might is most often displayed as the grace that cradles and transcends our brokenness and poverty of spirit. If you would be so broken that the light of his grace might be more visible within you, shining from your chipped seams and shattered fragments, then by all means make such earnest requests of him. Make them with sincerity and without reservation. But if the root of your prayer is rather some desire for a heightened prominence or sense of accomplishment and worth, either in your own eyes or in the eyes of others, then it would be better not to pray such prayers at all. Examine well your heart and motives before asking that his greatness be displayed in your life. When he answers, it will not be on your terms. For it is not you that will do great things for God, but God laboring in you and through you who will greatly accomplish his own good purposes according to the workings of his sovereignty and love. Be liberated now from this burden of believing that anything depends upon you. And so be liberated at last to give yourself to this joyful service in grateful response for the grace he has lavished upon you. You have till now been too invested in the results of your own efforts, as if those outcomes were a thing you could ever know or measure in this life. Be invested instead, child, in simple obedience to your king and in long faithfulness to his call, shepherding daily those gifts and tasks and relationships he has entrusted to you, regardless of outcomes or appearances. He will bring all things right in his way and in his time. All he asks is your willingness, your heart in his hands, your ways in his hands, your days in his hands. Be content in the station he has appointed you to run in this season, and yet be ever ready to move at the impulse of his love. Tend well those things that are before you, however humble they may be, and he will lead you in time to the good works he has appointed for you. Whether big or small is of no matter. He attaches no number to your service. It is your heart and faithfulness he appraises. Seek not your own glory. Seek God in his glory. will be seen in you radiant in humility and in the strength of his mighty might made manifest even in your brokenness, evident even in the smallest of services rendered unto him or offered in his name. Even though they be seen by none but you and him, your reward is secure. Is this still your heart's true desire then to do great works for the kingdom of heaven? Child of God, avail yourself of his spirit that you might go and learn to love God and others, practicing his mercies daily. There is no greater work appointed to you. May he strengthen and encourage you and lead you gently in that good way. Go in peace now to do his will. To Christ be the glory. Amen. If you found this video helpful or enriching to your life, you may find more of Cherry Grove Worship Services at the following link. If you wish to contact Cherry Grove Friends Church for more information, please contact our pastor, Mark Franklin. If you wish to leave a prayer request, go to our website and click on How Can We Pray For You?